Welcome everyone to the special uh, meeting of the Committee on City Services. I am City Councilor Stan Moulton, Chair of the Committee, and I will be presiding. I want to mention that our normal, um, uh, the this, the Council's uh, clerk, uh, uh, the Administrative Assistant, who normally would be clerking this meeting, uh, is uh, out ill today. So John Fry will be clerking the meeting. Appreciate your being here, John. Thank you. If you would call the roll, please. Uh, Councillor Moulton? Here. Councillor Labarge? Here. Councillor Dubbs? Here. Councillor Rothenberg? Councillor Rothenberg has uh, told me here. that she is ill and will be unable to be here today. We have uh, three members, which is a quorum. This meeting uh, is being audio and video recorded. Uh, so I will now ask uh, if there's anybody here, either in the room or uh, on uh, Zoom, who would like to make any public comment. If you're on Zoom, uh, you may raise your either your virtual hand or your physical hand. I don't see anyone, so we will proceed. We um, we don't have. Uh, Minutes of our last meeting are ready to um, approve today. So we will move on to items referred to committee. Uh, the first being the appointment of John Cartledge as uh, police chief, which was referred to us by the council on September 5th. Uh, uh, chief Cartledge, of course, has been the interim chief this year and uh, is now being put forward as the permanent chief. So I'll ask the mayor to uh, introduce her appointment. Gladly. Good evening, counselors. It is my absolute privilege to be here to speak to my appointment of John Cartledge as the police chief of the Northampton Police Department. Uh, he has served the Northampton Police Department for 29 years. He started as a patrol officer in 1995. He was promoted to sergeant in 2007, lieutenant in 2012, and captain of operations in 2015, and then captain of administration in 2019. And of course, as you've noted, John has served as the interim chief since former Chief Casper's departure uh, this year. John was also in charge of the department's field training program for many years and served as the accreditation manager for the department. We are incredibly fortunate to have someone with uh, the impeccable, impeccable credentials um, that he has, uh, who was able to step in and serve as interim when um, Chief Casper announced that she was leaving. The position of chief of police is obviously a critical one that carries a heavy responsibility for our community. Even though we had someone of the caliber of John Cartledge, I felt it was important that we have a thorough and competitive selection process for chief, which was facilitated by the firm Public Safety Consultants, or PSC. The position was posted widely, locally, regionally, and nationally, and to law enforcement associations. I appointed a seven-person advisory search committee, which included the Human Resources Director, Chad Dunham, Health and Human Services Commissioner, Meredith O'Leary, who oversees the Division of Community Care, City Council President, Alex Jarrett, who also served on the Northampton Policing Review Commission, at-large City Councilor, Garrett Perry, who serves on uh, the Officer Hiring Committee, UMass Amherst Assistant Vice Chancellor and Chief of Police, Tyrone Parnham, and Northampton residents, attorney Allison Pash, who is a staff attorney for the Public Defender Division and president-elect of the Hampshire County Bar Association, and Felicia Lundquist, who is a DAI training expert and co-chairs the uh, Community Engagement Committee of the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. I thank them and Chief of Staff Wolf, who coordinated the search for the very many, many hours and hard work that they uh, devoted to this search. After the rounds of interviews, Written questions and the assessment center, which was conducted by PSC, um, and an assessment center is a in very intense exercise that measures the candidate's knowledge, skills, abilities, and personal traits. Um, the search committee unanimously recommended that only one candidate be advanced, and they recommended that John Cartledge be appointed as Northampton's next police chief. That the unanimous decision was that he should be appointed chief serves as confirmation that we have an excellent person for this job. And I thank John for going through that very extensive and challenging process. During the search process, I heard from the Western Massachusetts Chiefs of, Chiefs of Police Association and individually from local chiefs and others who know John, as well as from former and current city colleagues of John Cartledge and those that work in the department. 
And I've been stopped by many, many, many Northampton residents, all of whom have wanted to tell me how much they admire John and think he would be a wonderful chief. This outpouring of support, the intensive interview process, the unanimous recommendation of the search committee, and my own direct experience working with John Cartledge for over a decade and closely with him since I've been mayor makes me proud to appoint him as chief of the Northampton Police Department. And I do so with the utmost confidence, great enthusiasm, and very deep respect. John knows this department and Northampton better than anyone. He was born and raised here. He has devoted his career to Northampton. He has a great love for the city and a very deep sense of responsibility to it. He is calm, he is respectful, he is thoughtful, and he is a person of the utmost integrity. Anyone who communicates with him knows he is extremely responsive and has very open communication. He is also ready to move the department forward. We have had many conversations about the division of community care, and he has been working very collaboratively with Commissioner O'Leary and her team as we have been implementing the first year of the DCC and integrating their response into the city's crisis and needs response. John has an open mind and a willingness to learn about and explore other ideas and possibilities and not to adhere strictly to a, quote, this is how it's always been done, end quote, kind of mindset. This is critical at this time when there's been state police reforms, and we as a city have said that there should be different types of response for different crises, and that not all seeking help are benefited by a police response. We have relied on PD and fire rescue as emergency response, as more and more calls have come to them over the years, as they are who, who are available 24 hours a day. But I know that John is collaborating with DHHS and is eager to work with them on DCC and another type of response. I have absolute confidence in Chief Cartlidge's ability to lead the department with professionalism and with heart. And I have had the privilege to get to know him these last few years. As I've said, John is a person of great integrity and we are extremely fortunate to have him serving the city of Northampton. And I thank the committee for your consideration of his appointment. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I now invite Chief Cartlidge, if you wanna make any, any remarks uh, before questions, please do. Thank you, Council. I appreciate being here. I don't know why I'm more nervous now than in front of the whole selection committee and the whole process I just went through. Um, I just want to say it's been a tremendous, um, tremendous career for me in this police department, and I intend on moving the department forward in a positive way with transparency and the utmost honor and respect for the community. Um, like the mayor said, this the process that I had to go through to get to this point was extremely difficult and long, and it made me realize who I am as a person again and as a police supervisor. Um, so I appreciate everything the everyone's done for me and all the people that took the time to reach out to the mayor and the selection committee and give me kudos for things that I've done, which a lot of people I just haven't seen in a long time. So I appreciate everything and I intend on doing the best to my ability for the city. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I also wanna note that um, uh, among uh, the remote attendees is Councilor Perry, who as the mayor mentioned, did serve on the search committee. So I think if any of us has questions about the search, uh, he would be available to answer questions about the search. Oh, counselors, questions? Yes. I have. We worked Thank so you. Hard to get them working. I know. <laughs> Anyways, the question goes to the mayor first, and then I want to talk with the chief. I know I did give you a call in regards, this was before they even started doing the search and so forth, in regards to Acting Chief Cartledge, I told you how impressive my residents were on Turkey Hill Road. Very valuable here, you know, and they had difficulties there. I explained to him as the acting chief what was happening there. I told him I talked with the residents, had a meeting with them. I gave, I said, he said, I'd like to talk with them, counselor. So I gave the, him their telephone number. He called them, made an appointment to outright go right up there. That's what we call communication here and the value of reaching out to residents. It's extremely important. And you know that, Mayor. 
And I want to thank you for doing that because people get a trust in them, of especially a mayor running our city and being able to communicate. And you know that for a fact also. So when we were up to Turkey Hill Road, he actually talked with the residents with the problems they were having of trucks going up at 6.30 in the morning. And we had one resident, which I think you had talked with him, which I know about, he had stones on his wall. And for all the years that he was there, and because of all those big construction going up there, putting up that monstrous home and all that property there, they were falling. And it's never done that. So he directly, acting chief Cart cartilage, went and saw the manager to find out what time that they were starting, and it was 7 o'clock. And it's a public road, so here they're traveling up at 6.30 in the morning to get set up so they could start at 7 o'clock. So I have to say, him going there, it did solve the problem, and that's extremely important. And I told you that, Mayor, this is what we need in our city is this communication with our department heads. When they're coming out, they want to see that. And it makes our mayor look like she cares also, which she does. And I know that. I've worked with her long enough. So I have a couple of questions. I want to thank you for being elected as our new chief. I can't tell you the phone calls that I got from people born and raised in the city with me. Very happy about this. And I know you like showing your visibility, which is unbelievable. Believe me, they're not used to it, Chief, at all. And you're out there. My question is, now that we have a resolution coming in from City Council, which is a resolution which I think, I don't know if you had time to even read that resolution. Have you read that? I did read it today, Council. Well, thank you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> what do you feel as a chief? I agree with this resolution that no matter who you are, what your gender is, that people will feel safe, not harassed here. What What do you feel about this? And how would you handle a situation like this? If somebody was having, being harassed, being frightful, we heard it. We heard it at city council for many people at open public session. And that means a lot to me and many people. I just got an email again from another resident on my ward about their granddaughter with that problem. So I would like to hear how you feel about this. I feel, I feel like our community in general is so open to everybody and it's a welcoming city and a sanctuary for many things. Um, and I feel like our department and our officers are trained. If they're if they're not from Northampton, they're embraced into the way we police here in Northampton. So I feel like there's not one officer on our department that would treat anyone any different than anyone else. And I feel like that's what separates us from other departments because we are Northampton and we are accepting of everything. So I feel like we we would have you know, an open, an open policy on treating people equally. Right. Chief Jody Casper and I worked very tirelessly together. And I think you know about the situation on Portsmouth Road with the Pride House. And these are students from high school. And I think you must know about the history there. She had sent me for the year of problems at that home. 93 phone calls into the police department. And the police had to go there and they were asked to walk the residents. And she said, counselor, she said, and when we had meetings, constant meetings, Zooming with the agency from Springfield. And she said, we don't have time for a phone call to say, you need to watch our residents. So my big concern was what was the staffing situation there and how were they handling the behaviors? So we did talk and everything. And... Thank goodness. Just having these meetings were very, very valuable by Zooming with Springfield and the director of the agency. It was very helpful, and the total communication was there. 
with Chief Casper on that. But to me, uh, you know, our police officers are very busy, very busy. And to be cool, to walk clients when you have your staff and they should be trained thoroughly, thoroughly to be able to handle a behavior. It caused and escalated a problem with residents on Emerson Way, their backyards. One of them is an RN. She had to lock her doors, shut her shades down, and her children could not even play in their own backyards. Things were pretty bad. Throwing things around in that, it's not happening anymore. And there's a lot of relief there. So training is extremely important. And I know just like the police department, whatever, whatever. In order to hand, and I've handled these type of problems when I was a supervisor, and it's important, and I was able to stress what was needed in that house, and it's solving the problem. So far, I'm not getting any calls on it, but we had several meetings with a Butters on Emerson Way. So anyways, I have to thank the police department for that. The visibility with Chief Casper was excellent, excellent. Sending me the amount of phone calls so we could talk with the CEO at that agency of exactly all the phone calls. So I'm glad to hear you come out about this resolution. I had to say what I had to say at city council. Nobody, nobody should ever be frightened in our city and be harassed. And I said, I'll make sure you come to me because then I'm going to call you. <laughs> exactly. No, I think our officers are trained well in the academy, in our field training program. They're indoctrinated into the way we do things in Northampton. And obviously, if there was any issue brought to my attention, I would oh, look I into it swiftly. So okay. now, say like with police officers, Chief, <laughs> how much training do they have with people with behaviors? I'm not exactly sure of the curriculum in the academy, but it is a whole new way of training officers these days. Um, they get a variety of different training in the academy, but in our field training program is where they really learn how to do things our way in Northampton. Um, they get the experience from many different officers for 15 weeks um, from their viewpoints and their experiences. So I think it's really our field training program that tailors them into learning how we police in Northampton. So, All right. I want to thank you for your service for 29 years. And I'm very, very happy that the commission of doing the interviewing process did the right thing. Many That's people were waiting to hear what the verdict was going to be. Mm -hmm. And another issue, too, that I heard, Mayor was that today, again, at the Rotary meeting, before a Rotary meeting, that I was asked, how come after t working for the city for 29 years and following and, you know, going up the ladder, why there had to be a committee formed? And I said, well, I said, I don't know if it's a state law, they have to do that. I don't know. Could you answer that for me? Sure. Um, there's not. And it was a choice that I made. And, and I'm very grateful to Chief Cartledge that he was willing to go through that process. It is an incredibly extensive process. But I thought that it was important that we um, really go through that. And, and first of all, open up and, and open up um, the possibility of applicants. And, um, you know, this is such a critical position. It's it's a position that's um looked at very carefully. It has great, great responsibility in the city. And I thought it was important that we do a full search for that position, well, that's even though we had problem. an excellent <laughs> candidate. Thanks. And thank you, Chief. Thanks. Really Council. appreciate you getting that position. Thank you, Councillor. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor. Questions? <laughs> Councillor Dubs. Um, I just want to um, carry it on similar to what Councilor LaBarge was asking me about um, training and uh, protecting certain people in the population. That I was curious about police training on people with disabilities, for example, on um, like the ADA training on that and what the policies are. Um, just like one example I had is, um, for example, um, uh, what procedures uh, would you follow to arrest and transport a person in a wheelchair, for example, something like that. 
That's a good question, Councillor. <laughs> um, so as far as, like I said to Councillor Labarge, the training in the academy, I don't, I haven't been there in a long time. And I'm not sure exactly what they get in the academy for that sort of topic. Um, but through their field training and while they're in field training, we do make arrests in certain circumstances. And we have arrested people who need special circumstances and um we would um if you if you're saying someone in a wheelchair um we would make arrangements with uh, the jail for for instance or um our local the, the fire department may come and help us like get the person to the proper like if they're if they have to be booked in the booking room um we wouldn't just put them in the back of a cruiser you know if it's not appropriate so we would make arrangements for the person to get there safely to the police department, be processed like anyone else and get their wheelchair to the station and then make arrangements to go to the jail or court or be released. Um, it's just like a case by case basis. So you're welcome. Yeah. It's a good question. Anything else, counselor? Uh, so yeah, I definitely, if you don't mind, um, I want to consider you and ask me. Uh, if I could ask you a question. There were periods, um, given that you've been on the Northampton Police Department for many years, do, are there any policies or procedures that you would like to change in the future? Um, my immediate response to that would be, what I really want to do is get back to more, even more community policing than we do right now. Um, I feel like we do so many things right now. We have the, like coffee with a cop, we have um, the Citizen Police Academy. We have a ride-along program. We have um, officers who are liaisons to certain people in the community and groups in the community. Um, we have so many different, we have the bike patrol that's part of the, you know, our regular patrol. Um, but I feel like COVID hit and then it was just a bad time. So I feel like getting our officers, especially the ones who aren't from Northampton and need to learn more in-depth stuff about our community. Um, just developing more programs where the officers can interact with the public and different you know, business owners and things like that. Um, I did recently, uh, last month I started this new program called Chat with a Chief. So it's just, it's like coffee with a cop and it's really nothing extravagant. It's just me picking locations once a month, going there and people can come talk to me directly and it's not at the police department. So people don't have to feel intimidated or whatever. Um, and I feel like it's a good way for people to be able to just meet me in the public and talk for a little while. We, the first one I did was at the senior center. Um, there was only five people, but it was like a good, it was good because it was like an intimate setting and the people that were there were they had great questions and I feel like it was better than a group of 50 people because I couldn't get to them all. So, um, but that's one thing. Um, yeah, just different programs I'm looking at to try to get out there more because I feel like we're still coming out of like COVID and our officers need to be out there more. So, Thank you. yep, you're welcome. Thank you, Counselor. Um, has the Citizens uh, Police Academy started again post post covid um so last year council we tried to get it going again and the sign up was not a good turnout it was like four people that we're going to try to do it again this winter and uh get a better attendance it was uh as i recall a very popular program at one time and uh, i i believe that that the community found it to be uh informative everyone i spoke to after that program was they couldn't believe the stuff that they learned that they they don't know that we do um each officer has a a niche or whatever we had people talk about accreditation or field training crime scene um you know how to run radar or whatever it is but they really do learn a lot and i welcome any of you to sign up and and take the course. Um, it's it's like eight weeks, once a week for eight weeks. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, 
I wanted to follow up on uh, something the mayor uh, said in her introduction, and uh, that is um, integration uh, with the Division of Community Care. And we, we talked about this a bit during the budget hearing in May. There are a substantial number of calls uh, that involve a, a mental health concern that the PD uh, responds to over 1,200 last year. Um, and you do have a clinician that responds to, to some of them with <laughs> with officers, some of them uh, on their own. What what thoughts do you have about how now to integrate the uh, the DCC into that process in appropriate uh, uh, settings where, where they could respond? And, and I know that there's some legislation that may be needed to make the process more flexible because once dispatch gets a call, there are certain times when it can't be referred out to DCC, but just your thoughts about how you'll pursue that this year. Certainly, thanks, Councillor. Um, we've had several meetings, uh, Kelly from dispatch, the fire department, myself and the DCC over the last many months on how to properly incorporate them into calls. Um, in the next few weeks, I have a meeting, a Zoom meeting with the previous uh, police chief from Denver, Colorado, which he was a big part of their civilian responders out there and one other gentleman. So Kelly and I will be meeting with him virtually to talk about that. Um, during our previous meetings, we've come up with or borrowed from them. It's called the Denver Star Model. And I think I talked about it at the budget hearing. But essentially, a call comes into dispatch. The dispatcher can ask a variety of questions, and if if all those answers are are no, then it goes to another set of questions, and if all those are no, then it goes to the DCC worker, um, which will be very helpful. There's also a um, an online portal which dispatch will have access to, so it could be in real time where we can insert a call to the DCC and then their responder can follow up on their computer and we can have like an information sharing. Um, but right now we're still kind of on the model where a supervisor is making the call from our police department or dispatch. And if it's a call where we really think the DCC can go, then we just send them, um, but like you said, counselor, we do have our own, our own co-responders, which if it's a mental health call and kind of an emergency, they're just going with the officers right away. We we have followed up um, some of the calls with people like sleeping on benches or someone had called about a safety concern, a health concern. We'll call the DCC directly. And if they're available, they'll send someone out and it might be someone they've already spoken with or checked on. Um, but it's kind of still in the stages where we're trying to figure out an exact method to send which calls to, but we're all, I feel like we're all open to everything. And like, I mean, we don't, we don't want to go to all those calls really either. We'd gladly send them, but we do have the co-responders embedded in our police department um, on a grant. So it's, we're trying to do it all with everybody um, right now. But my, my future is to integrate the DCC further and have them directly take calls um, from dispatch. That would be the best case scenario. I agree. And I think that it's important to, um, to, to keep all the available resources that we have. And I think that the co-responders that are grant funded are an important part of the, the, the triage, so to speak. Um, and uh, that that model has worked well, and now we've got to work in this this additional resource, the the DCC, in an appropriate way, and it has to be done in a way that makes sense both for um, responding to uh, you know emergencies where you don't have a lot of time to you know to to sort of parse out who who best to send. So Correct. obviously that. Um, that is part of it, but I think that it's very important to, uh, as you, as you have uh, started doing, uh, to uh, work with uh, 
uh, your counterparts and figure out as we go along here how to best deploy those resources. So I appreciate your attention to that already. The other big picture uh, kind of question I wanted to ask you is um, about staff uh, recruitment and, and retention. And you noted last uh, at the in your budget message that last year, I believe there were 10 officers who left seven uh, or three retired and seven just left the force. And of course, retirements are somewhat predictable, but the the officers who leave take with them a lot of money that the city's invested in their in their training. And it also leaves, in some cases, leaves the PD short staffed and adds to overtime and tired officers and so forth. So, any thoughts about, I know this is not a problem that's unique to Northampton, but any thoughts that you've had about ways that you can retain officers? I've thought about this for the past 10 years, but um, you're right, it's not just Northampton, but I feel that, so we're, we're running a police department, but what I want to do is make it better than it is right now better than it was and make it a friendly place to work. I want them to feel like they don't want to leave, even if the money's better somewhere else. Um, I feel like recruiting people who will stay. A lot of times, you know, we, we do the college fairs and things like that, but a lot of times we get kids who are from out east or from a different state and we they get offered a job and then we have no way to, to keep them there with a contract or anything like that. So having them buy into our police department and want to stay is one of my big goals. Like, but it, that's, that's hard to do if someone just wants to get the police academy and then go out on to another department. Cause these days you can go any, anywhere after you're trained in the academy. When I was getting hired, you couldn't get hired anywhere to save your life um it was very competitive and these days once you have the academy you're, you're you can go anywhere um but our department has so much more to offer than many of the departments around we have like i said bike patrol we have the walking beat we have crime scene services detectives um and many other specialty units that a department of our size might not have and trying to um, get them to buy into our department and, and not want to leave and like have it be a fun place to work in a way, even though, you know, you're working for a police department, it's a paramilitary organization, but still you can, I don't want employees to feel like they dread coming to work. I want them to enjoy coming to work and you know it hasn't always been like that at the police department everyone has bad days but in general people should want to come to work and be able to talk freely to their supervisors and get to know your employees that's important so um we made one of the a few of the different ways we've tried to recruit more and more diverse populations is we stop doing an entrance exam. We now people can apply right online and it goes right to my email. Um, we've made the process more simple. We've reached out to every college around and try to go to every college, including all female colleges and everywhere else. Um, once we see a prospective candidate, we latch onto them and get them right in for a ride along interview and everything we try to keep that communication going and relationship not like the old days where you just applied and then prayed that you got a call this is like you have to keep on them and show them that you care there's not just a list anymore you know so making them feel wanted and part of the department right from the get-go the first day they come in and sign paperwork with a conditional offer we give them a tour of the station and sign them up for a ride along. We introduce them to everybody in the station and like right there, you start building your rapport with them. So um, I feel like that's what we have to do these days because no one 
it's everyone's competing with the same candidates it feels like so um that's my general goals well i think i think um being proactive in recruiting and then when you feel that you've got a strong candidate i think the phrase you used make them feel wanted very important so i i'm glad to hear that that's that's being that's your approach and that's being being done thanks counselor i've got two questions Go ahead, counselor. yes um chief heart lunch probably about three weeks ago I know how many staff do you have on during the day and on second shift and third shift? Uh, so we have the minimum staffing is five, well, four patrol cars, one bike patrol or walking beat, and one supervisor. That's typically each shift. Um, there could be two supervisors. We have a detective bureau, but they don't. They don't count for staffing. They will go out on calls if it's crazy, but you know, so it's typically five five uniformed people for the entire city and one or two supervisors. Midnights uh, overnight, um, at three in the morning, it drops lower for the last four hours till seven in the morning when the new shift comes in. I noticed on West Dampton Road that many people have of the cruisers out there a lot, which they appreciate. And it happened right before our driveway at our home. And it was amazing. My husband was out there and the cruiser stopped a white vehicle. He went up very pleasant, my husband said. And he said, do you know how fast you were going? She said, no. He said, there are speed limits. She said, I don't see any. She said, I live up in the hill. She said, you live up in the hill? When you come down your driveway, there's speed limits. She said, well, I don't appreciate that. He said, I'm going to tell you right now, you were going 45 miles an hour on a 35-mile speed zone. Okay? She was a mouth. And he said, you know, I was trying to be nice to you. But when you tell me, that there's no speed limit signs and you're coming down the hill and it's right there. Mm -hmm. And it was like, he ticketed her. I want to ask you if it's 35 miles an hour, at 45 miles an hour, they should be ticketed. Okay, <clears throat> Why are they giving people a leeway of five miles more? We got some out there constantly on Ryan Road, on West Farms Road, it's a problem of the speeding on West Stanton Road. That's... The mayor knows that we've had problems there with Glendale Road also. Very concerned about this. If it's 35, why did they give them a break five miles beyond? <clears throat> so that's officer discretion, and we can't direct them to give a, a money ticket or not. It's like that would be like a quota kind of which is not legal but we can tell them to go out and enforce speed limits on whatever street and each officer kind of has their own their own mindset um on when to write a money ticket or when but there's nothing in writing yeah they could get a money ticket for one mile over the speed limit or in general i shouldn't even say this but in general to like t up to 10 miles hour an hour over i mean i i used to give a written warning and then from 10 10 and up they'd get a money ticket but that's that was just my like there's no writing on or standards on what to do it just sitting there and stopping the car and giving a verbal warning or just sitting on the side of the road and not doing anything, it's still some sort of enforcement. But I understand what you're saying. Just there's nothing. A lot of people are questioning that. You know, I like the idea, like hard, no way. We have no speed limit at all, at all. And I'm hearing it again. And we have 24 children there. And they're complaining about the speeding going on there also. Mm -hmm. We don't have sidewalks on West Stanton Road. A little bit of sidewalks on Ryan Road. And West West Farms Road, we have no sidewalks. So how do we protect? I know Donna Lascalia, our director, is here this evening, and I appreciate that. 
She worked tirelessly with Counselor Nash and I for about two years of the intersection of Glendale Road, West Farms Road, and um, Glendale Road, West Farms Road, and West Stanton Road. We had one accident with five people on the road at that intersection. It took us just about, what, down to two years, I think it was, with the idea of the flashing lights. We only had one incident since that happened. The girl went right through the flashing light on Glendale Road, which was her fault. Nobody got hurt, thank God. So my question is, we need it on Glendale Road. We definitely, I mean, on Cardinal Way, definitely need a speed limit. The cars are phenomenal there. I've been told, well, it's a lot because of the kids on that street. <laughs> I'm hearing differently from professionals in there. So maybe it's something we need to look at here of saying, well, I would like Donna, I would like you, I would like a street meeting with the residents on Cardinal Way. Donna did go with Chief Casper. Nobody knew about them being there, and they would have appreciated that at least the DPW director or somebody be there. So there's a problem. And even with the fire chief recently, him and I talked. He said, I agree. They need to have a speed limit there. And he said it's out of his hands. You know, he can't go around and talk to people. So... I, I'm going to set up a meeting because it's in dire need. I mean, Donna was able to get a stop sign on Redford Drive, thank God, because we have no sidewalks and the, and the children have to cross. I have children who and parents who try to cross on West Stanton Road from Glendale Road over to West Farms Road. It's just the speeding is terrible, Mayor. You know, somebody's going to get hurt. So that's what it's all about here. And I'm glad you are who you are. You care about the community, and I appreciate that. And many other people do, too. Thank you. Thanks, Counselor. Uh, thank you, Counselor. I appreciate your concerns about speeding. Um, and I think that you'll take the appropriate steps through the proper channels and work with both the Director Lascalia and Chief Cartledge on that. That's right. <laughs> Okay, any other questions for uh, Chief Cartledge? Uh, I would then entertain a motion for a recommendation. I'll make a motion to recommend. I Chief second Cartledge. that. Okay, that's a motion uh, made by Councillor Dubbs, seconded by Councillor Barge for a positive recommendation on the uh, appointment of uh, John Cartledge as permanent police chief. To full city council. Yes, that will go to the full city council. Um, is there any further discussion? All right, I'd like to say just before we vote that um, I think that uh, when you have a person who has served for nearly three decades uh, on the Northampton Police uh, Department who has advanced uh, consistently through the ranks uh, as sergeant, uh, lieutenant, captain of operations, captain of administration, and then as interim police chief, uh, someone who is uh, very well respected in the community, uh, as uh, has been noted, uh, has spent his entire life in the community, is well respected in the department, is well respected by colleagues uh, elsewhere, um, that that is to me an obvious choice to be our next police chief. But I do think uh, the question was asked by Council LaBarge about whether a search was necessary. And as the mayor said, no, it was not necessary. But I also think that it's valuable, even when you have an outstanding internal candidate, to measure that person against, against others. And that was done in this case. There was a consultant uh, who was hired to direct the search, there was a, uh, as the mayor uh, said, there was a, a, um, a search committee that considered the other candidates. We know that there's not a, not, not a large group of people who apply to be police chief uh, these days. Um, but uh, we did have the opportunity as a community to measure uh, Chief Cartledge against uh, his, his peers. And uh, uh, as is evident by the unanimous recommendation by the search committee, uh, he measured up 
extremely well. So I am very, very happy to support this uh, appointment. So, John, if you would call the roll, please. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Dubs? Yes. Councillor Molden? Yes. Uh, that is a, a three vote positive recommendation. Uh, and that will go to the city council at our next meeting, which is October 1st. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, I am certain that you have more important things to do than provide technical support. I know. I will. <laughs> and I, Alan. Uh, I appreciate your willingness to serve. I will. Uh, I think I can get us through the rest of the meeting, get the equipment turned off without, uh, <laughs> you know, without causing any undue uh, alarms. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alan and Annie, for helping us. <laughs> so. Um, Bye, Mayor. Uh, on to our uh, our next appointment uh, is uh, Aaron Irvin, who is uh, uh, being considered for appointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals. This was referred by City Council on August 15th, and um, the interview was done by Councilor Rothenberg, who uh, was able to uh, to get her report to Councilor Dubs, who's going to read it to us. So thank you, Councilor. Of course, uh, happy to read for Councillor Rothenberg. Uh, this is the report on the appointment of Aaron Irvin to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Aaron grew up in Boston and developed an early interest in how communities develop and grow. She studied regional planning at UMass and then changed directions somewhat, becoming a self-employed and largely self-taught carpenter. She lived in Oakland, Berkeley, Berkeley, Austin, and East Hampton before settling in Northampton in the late 80s. At one point, she built herself a home to live in. She also taught math at Cutchins for 10 years and initiated a fundraiser to remodel her classroom, fit with custom furniture and a beautiful chalkboard. Erin first became aware of the opportunity to serve on planning-related committees recently in response to the development of a property next to her home. Concerned about issues such as stormwater and how the land could be optimally utilized, she began attending meetings and was intrigued by the engaging conversation of the board and the complex questions raised by infill. As we look for ways to address the housing shortage, she says, it is imperative to think about planning broadly as a community rather than only looking at things parcel by parcel, as forces of nature like water are, of course, not bound by property lines. Erin is deeply interested in the interdependence of human civilization within what she describes as an increasingly complicated world and believes we can and must take better care of each other and the planet, that the world is at a turning point that requires more imagination in our planning and solving of existing problems of all kinds, not just limited to housing, but also regarding politics, education, and beyond. As stated on her application, Erin has always had a particularly strong interest in sustainable planning. And she feels that increased communication between developers and abutters paired with thoughtful, inquisitive dialogue amongst the board will help us arrive at the kind of broad solutions we need in order to best serve the community now and into the future. I trust that she will carry out her duties thoughtfully and effectively, and I find her to be polite, good-humored, and articulate. I believe she will make an excellent addition to the Zoning Board of Appeals and will consider all matters with an open mind and an attentiveness to real problems in need of solutions. I therefore enthusiastically submit this report to the Committee on City Services with a positive recommendation for Ward 3 resident Erin Irvin, with gratitude for her application and willingness to serve. Signed, Councillor Rothenberg. Thank you, Councillor Dubs. Appreciate the uh, teamwork there. No problem. <laughs> um, so, obviously, um, uh, Councilor Rothenberg is not here to answer any questions, but I think she's uh, submitted a very positive uh, report. Um, if anyone has any questions based on the application, otherwise I will entertain a motion for a uh, recommendation on Aaron Irvin. Yes, I make a positive recommendation to John, I mean to Irv, Erwin Irvin to be referred 
to the city council to be approved to go on the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, that's a positive recommendation made by uh, Councilor Labarge, seconded by Councilor Dubs for Aaron Irvin's appointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, any further discussion? If not, roll call, John. Councilor Dubs. Yes. Councilor Moulton. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that's a 3 0 uh, vote, a positive recommendation. Uh, on Aaron Irvin to the Zoning Board of Appeals that will go to the full City Council on uh, October 1st. Thank you. So then the final um, set of appointments which have been sent to the, uh, to the committee uh, are all new appointments. So they all require um, an interview by one of us. And since Councilor Rothenberg just did one. I think that um, the three of us will take on this next set uh, of appointees. They are. Please. Okay. Okay. They are John Schlins to the Central Business Architecture Committee, uh, Rachel Flynn Kasuba to the uh, Energy and Sustainability, and uh, Jasmine. Good speed to the human rights. I, don't have, I have the human rights. I have Jasmine. Good speed. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Who is the other ones? Uh, John Schlund. John Schlund. Yeah. And uh, I'll do Rachel it. Flynn Kasuba. I'd be glad to do the Human Rights Commission. Okay. So Council Labarge uh, has uh, asked to interview. Uh, Jasmine Goodspeed, uh, who's a candidate for appointment to the Human Rights Commission. Yep. Um, I will I will uh, say that uh, John Schloons uh, lives in Ward 4. And uh, I know you have an interest in central business architecture. So would you like to, to take his interview? I'd love that. Yeah, thank All you. Right. So Councilor Dubs will interview John Schloons. And that means uh, that I will interview Rachel Flynn Kasuba who uh, lives in Ward 3 and uh, is up for the Energy and Sustainability Commission. So those interviews, um, if you could plan to do those in the next two weeks to report back at our next regular meeting on October 7th. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that brings us to... And how about the others? Please? Okay. So... Uh, okay. Councilor Labarge remembers that we had three other new appointments that were uh, actually four new appointments that were referred at Thursday's meeting. Yes. But because it's within a week's time, right. they're not on the agenda tonight. So yep. we're not going to do anything with those. We'll take them up on October 7th and assign interviews. Sounds okay? like a plan to me. So that will catch us up. Yep. Okay. So our next meeting is the usual first Monday in October, which is uh, October 7th. Uh, is there any new business? No. Otherwise, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Okay. Second that. Mo motion by Council Labarge, second by Council Dubs to adjourn. Roll call, John. Councilor Moulton. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Dubs. Yes. That is a unanimous vote to adjourn at 555. Thank you. Good meeting. Thank you to everyone who participated and all of those who helped behind the scenes to get this meeting set up technically. <laughs>